This video is now in session, and Florida has a new gubernatorial candidate running to replace Ron DeSantis. So, um, in addition to Florida, there's also Arizona. Arizona, there is another candidate, another well-respected candidate, that plans to run to replace Doug Ducey. Both of them are, both Doug Ducey and Ron DeSantis are Republican governors, and both candidates are uh, Democrats. So, for the first one, we have Nikki Freed. Nikki Freed was the former, well, not the former, but actually the current Florida, Florida Commissioner of Agriculture. And by that self, that might not seem like a lot, but like the Commissioner of Agriculture in most states is not that important. Or, I mean, it is important, but like relative to governorship, it's not that important. In Florida, it's a little bit more important, but by itself, it wouldn't constitute a massive, um, a massive, I guess, um, outburst of donations, but for Nikki Fried specifically in her situation, she actually stands to benefit from being the Democrats' only statewide representative. So uh, what I mean by that is in the Florida state office, you have the governor's position, the AG, the, um, uh, the lieutenant governor's position, and a slew of other positions. Democrats don't have any of those with the exception of the Florida Commissioner of Agriculture. This is the only statewide office that they have. They don't have any Senate races. They, they don't have any, um, yeah, just no races. It's all been gone to Republicans with the exception of Nikki Freed. And Nikki Freed won in the same ballot that uh, Ron DeSantis won in 2018 against Andrew Gillum, uh, the de uh, Democratic candidate for the 2018 elections. Um, so the main, so she's one of the main contenders for that reason, and in terms of Poland, she actually isn't doing that bad with uh, hypothetical Poland, um, but not hypothetical here. This kind of Poland, uh, he she, uh, in terms of non R po pollsters, gets forty five percent of the vote and forty two percent of the vote, and then here you have Victory Insights that has forty seven percent of the vote. Um, now, they are a Republican pollster, but the fact that Nikki Fried is up 47%, or I guess down 47% because she's not really winning against Ron DeSantis in the poll, but that's a little bit worrying for Ron DeSantis but because he's supposed to win by 7% or, or more in these kinds of elections, um, kind of demonstrating his popularity among Floridians. And then if we look at Charlie Crist, the other major Democratic nominee, you can see that the margins uh, right here for Victory Insights, they are 47% to 53%. Now, th they might, Victory Insights probably has some kind of motive behind this. So um, it's hard to kind of say, it's kind of, the numbers are definitely skewed one way or another. But um, even then, the, the fact that Ron DeSantis is not at 55% or even more than that shows that Ron DeSantis isn't quite immune from some kind of level of competitiveness. He is definitely favored, and he is still likely to win by Floridian voters, but it's not entirely sure with these two candidates, with Charlie Crist and Nikki Freed. So for Charlie Crist, Charlie Crist is currently the representative from Florida's 13th Congressional District, but that's not actually her, uh, his main uh, qualification. His main qualification was that he was the governor of Florida. He used to be the governor of Florida, and he used to be a Republican before he went to being Democratic. So you can see here um, at uh, his list, he was governor of Florida from 2007 to 2011, and he was Republican before 2010 and then changed to independent from 2010 to 2012 before going to be uh, as Democrat, uh, Democratic in 2012. So it's very clear here that he has won statewide elections before. He was the Education Commissioner of Florida, he was the Florida Attorney General, and then he was Governor of Florida. Um, now, both candidates are relatively good. Uh, they are relatively the same in terms of their politics, but um, the main thing, I guess, that separates them is that Charlie Crist is currently a House member while Nikki Freed is a statewide me uh, member, which then makes Nikki Freed more favorable in terms of uh, electorally speaking than uh, Charlie Crist. We can see here in these elections, uh, in the 2018 election, he won by 15%, and then in the 2020 election, he won by uh, 7%. So it's a little bit less, but still um, a good number compared to 2016, which was around 4%. 
Uh, and then for Nikki Fried, in terms of her electoral um, status, uh, how she was elected into the Florida Agriculture Commissioner, you can see here that she won by just the slightest of margins, by 0.08%. And that's a very low percent to win, but compared to the last election for Flo the Commissioner of Agriculture, that's a flip, uh, or that's a flip to towards Democrats by 8.71 percentage points. And if we look at every single other election in Florida, then you'll see that um, in terms of Florida elections, they all went to Republicans. The attorney general position went to Republicans. The um, di uh, district attorneys, the s uh, state Supreme Courts, all went to Republicans. Now, obviously, not all Flo uh, Florida state Supreme Court members are Republicans, but it's a resounding majority uh, in the court um, for the state. And uh, those are the two candidates for Florida's election. Now, there's uh, both of them are good, which... It's kind of a problem because if both of them are good, then uh, Florida voters have to choose between two good candidates and thus voters, Democratic voters, are split upon one or another. Now, Charlie Crist right now, according to the St. Pete's poll, is favored to win against Nikki Freed, but we'll have to see how this polls out. And, um, and if you have two good candidates... Uh, it's especially a problem in Florida because Florida's primary system is very late, as in, uh, uh, as in like, uh, Florida holds its primaries very late. <laughs> uh, usually, the um, uh, states hold them in June or in that time period. But for Florida, I believe, um, yeah, uh, for Florida, it doesn't quite state here, but it's around August. It's around um that area. And even though two months might not make that much difference, it makes a lot of difference in a very competitive state. So if Democrats want to do well in the general election, they have to make sure that they can pivot from the primary strategy to the general election strategy. Because if Charlie Crist and Nikki Freed go on an all-out um, all battle against each other, somewhat similar to Hillary Clinton and uh, Bernie Sanders in 2016, then that's going to end really badly for Democrats uh, when it comes to the general election because they only have um, they only have around three months to prepare for the general election against Ron DeSantis, who faces a clear field. Even though there's one other uh, one other member that declared in the Republican primary, Ron DeSantis is definitely going to win the primary. So that's the Florida race. Uh, that's all that's to note for now, and we'll see how this pans out because it will be an interesting election. Republicans are definitely favored, but it's still interesting to see how Democrats respond to the years of losses that they've had in Florida. Now, going over to the Arizona gubernatorial election, this is to replace Doug Ducey. Doug Ducey is term limited. He's already served two terms before, and he's unlikely, well, he's not unlikely, he can't serve another term. So in terms of the Republican side, the main people that have declared, or I guess the main person that has declared, is Kimberly Yee. And then meanwhile, we have Andy Biggs as a potential candidate. Um, and then Paul Go Gosar, who before publicly expressed interest, now has declined that opportunity. Uh, and he instead is uh, re announcing re-election for his uh, House seat. So we can see here that those are the endorsements. And then for the Democratic primary, um, it's kind of similar to Florida, where we have both of them are good candidates in terms of uh, their prior jobs and their current jobs. So we have Katie Hobbs, who is currently the Arizona SOS, um, and the Secretary of State manages elections. She's very well known for helping to manage the Arizona election. And then uh, Marco, a, uh, Marco Lopez Jr., who was the former chief of staff of the U.S. CBP under the Obama administration, and he used to be the former mayor of Nogales. And uh, Nogales, by the way, is a city or a town, I guess. It's, uh, it's between those two. Um, it's along the border between the United States and Mexico. So both candidates are good because for Katie Hobb, she's served, she is serving a statewide position, and she was able to win it in the same year that um, that Doug Ducey was able to win, uh, albeit, uh, um, uh, gov uh, governorship, albeit it's not like the same way as Florida, where Nikki Fried is the only Democratic statewide, um, 
statewide, uh, I guess, uh, um, officership for the Democratic Party. For the, the uh, for Arizona, it's more like the opposite, where Doug Ducey is the only Republican. Um, obviously, Doug Ducey is not the only Republican serving in the state of Arizona, but Democrats are pretty much even with uh, Republicans in the statewide offices of Arizona. Democrats hold uh, both Senate seats, and uh, they also hold the SOS position. Meanwhile, Republicans hold the governorship, the lieutenant governorship, and the attorney general position, I believe. So, um, anyway, Katie Hobbs uh, won in 20, uh, 2018, and we can see in this election right here that she won by uh, pretty low. It's actually kind of the same margin as... Um, as uh, Nikki Freed, she won by 0.8 percentage points. And this was back in 2018, by the way, when Arizona was deemed more Republican. And you can see turnout was up by 62.77% compared to here, where it was 46.11%. Uh, and you can see that Democrats were able to win as a result of turnout in Maricopa County. And that's, uh, that's Katie Hobbs. Meanwhile, Mario Lopez Jr., um, his background as part of the CBP may be useful um, in uh, in trying in quelling the fears of immigration because immigration will probably be an issue in Arizona and um, the border wall will probably be an issue. What to do with it now that it's no, no longer being constructed and how we should allow um, refugees and those who have to come over the border. Um, and how do we make it legal for that process to happen? Those are the kinds of questions that will most likely be asked for the immigration um, policies of Arizona, which is particularly important as Arizona is a border state. So Marco Lop uh, uh, Lopez Jr. may bring some kind of experience there as the chief of staff of the U.S. CBP. Um, but again, it's kind of like the Florida race. We'll just have to wait and see how this pans out. But both of them are good candidates, a statewide candidate and um, a former USCPP candidate. Now, this kind of candidate might not be that useful. Like being a former chief of staff of the USCPP, it might not be that useful in Arizona compared to a state like Texas or a state like Florida where it might be a lot more useful. But um, nonetheless, uh, it still could provide an advantage for Democrats. Uh, in terms of hypothetical polling, it's a uh, toss-up for the most part, but we can see here in terms of a generic poll, a generic Republican has 42% of the vote and a generic Democrat has 39% of the vote, but 19% of the vote is undecided. So this is a true toss-up race, and I'd say for now it actually leans, if I had to choose either Republican or Democratic, it'd probably tilt a little bit towards Democratic because Biden won the election in t uh, 2000, um, 2020, and then for the 2022 races in Arizona, there is a statewide race that's being held, which is the 2022 Arizona Senate race. Uh, and currently, Mark, um, Mark, um, Mark, how do I not remember him? Mark, uh, that's the wrong, <laughs> that's the wrong, wrong one, Arizona Senate. Uh, Mark Kelly, I believe. Um, and we can see if we go down here. So yeah, Mark Kelly is currently the U.S. Senator. Uh, from Arizona, he's a Democrat, and this might help whoever will be the Democratic nominee for Arizona in the 2022 election because Mark Kelly is likely to win this election again. It's going to probably be by lean margins, the same as last time, but it's still, um, but that's still, it's that's not the same thing as like the chances that you actually have of winning. Um, it's likely to see that Mark Kelly will win, and you can see in all of these hypothetical pollsters by OH Predictive Insights that Mark Kelly wins in every single one of them. Um, and that's why you see some of them, uh, some of the sources predict in a lean Democratic result. And that's, um, that, uh, and that's how the, Arizo the Democrats might do well in the Arizona governor's race come 2022 because, uh, because um, you don't have Doug Ducey running for the uh, governor's uh, race for another term. And as a result, um, Democrats are kind of clearing the field for them to win in this election. Doug Ducey is really the only person left in Arizona as a Republican who can win in, in statewide offices by a large margin. He won here by 15% in the 2018 election. He won here by... Um, 
by 13% in the 2014 election. So he actually expanded his vote between 2014 and 2018. And by the way, Demo uh, 2018, it was a wave year for Democrats in Arizona. But Doug Ducey won by safe margins in Arizona, which shows that he's very popular among his, his constituents. And we'll see that. Um, and it's likely to see that if he's gone, then it will be much easier for Democrats to win in this race. So that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. This video is now adjourned, and I'll see you in the next one.